Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I think we can get started. And uh, uh, let me start with a few technicalities uh, concerning the afternoon part of uh, uh, this uh, workshop. First of all, uh, this workshop is going to be divided into two parts. Uh, one, the first part starts now and it will uh, be ended at uh, 3.30. And then we shall have a coffee break just for uh, relaxation. And after that, half an hour later, we start again the afternoon session. And uh, this we, uh, we plan to finish at 5.30. Um, first of all, may I ask you to turn off or uh, silence your mobiles. Uh, because uh, there could be an interference with the uh, gist of the speeches from time to time. Um, there is a simultaneous interpretation uh, in English, French, Russian and German. Uh, English is uh, number 11, French 10, uh, Russian 9 and German 8. The sequence was written like this, this is why I went back to was the smaller figures. Um, we shall have a specific structure for this afternoon session. There will be a keynote speech launched by one of the panelists uh, who actually will also participate in the panel discussion afterwards. And uh, uh, each panelists will have the possibility to, in, uh, to express their views afterwards on the specific subject. And of course, I am going to open the floor for the audience for questions. So please feel free to intervene, to indicate that you have questions. Uh, roughly after the third panelist expressed his or her view. Um, the workshop is going to be split up uh, according to two major approaches in the subject. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, going to be uh, the following. First of all, the first part will talk about uh, the long-term considerations and uh, uh, it is also tackling a little bit the crisis or, or quite a bit the crisis. And uh, uh, we want to talk about or exchange views about the potential energy issues, uh, the pricing of the energy, the volatility of the uh, energy prices, and a potential return to the high oil prices in the future. And we also tackle, uh, in a way, the uh, reliability of the transport sector. This is going to be the package of the uh, elements which we would like to cover during the first part of the session. Uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Zoltan Kozachai. I am the Deputy Director General of DG TREN, working for the European Commission. And uh, my key responsibility is the coordination of transport issues, policy questions, and uh, so forth. Uh, but I'm not going to be the key player in this. Uh, the people, uh, the panelists who are sitting around the, people are, uh, around the table are going to be much more important because it is them who will express their views on the subject and it is them who will tell you hopefully some new information how they see the uh, issue, the subject which uh, is the uh, subject of the afternoon part, or the first part of the afternoon session. Uh, we plan to deal, or to go into the depth of the questions dealing with the um, global economy. And uh, uh, global economy, uh, which is a rather complex exercise and a rather complex question itself, will be approached from the side of the transport sector. Or panelists here around the table are experts in, 
in uh, the different aspects of the transport and the transportation activities. They will uh, express their views and the views of their institutions they represent here. And uh, it is going to be hopefully an interesting forum for everybody because it gives you the opportunity to exchange views or to put questions to the panelists. And uh, you can also ask uh, uh, questions like what is the uh, basic future of the transport area if we uh, uh, bear it in mind that today we have to face with the consequences of the economic downturn. Is it really, by the way, uh, a kind of a development, a natural development or evolution, what we are witnessing now, or is it artificially created and uh, it's going to uh, remedy itself uh, without any effort, or do we have to do something if we want to put an end to the uh, process of the recession, uh, which is not only a technical issue, but it's also a social and a political issue, and it's getting to be more and more important from those aspects as well. Uh, our first keynote speaker is going to be Mr. Jean-Claude Raoul, who is from the Académie de Technologie, uh, Technologie France, uh, and uh, uh, he, is the, he is the person who is dealing with uh, transport mobility. He was earlier the technical director of the transportation activities in Paris. And just by coincidence, it turned out that we were almost colleagues because he also worked for the uh, European Commission and uh, the uh, predecessor of the present DG Tran. And he was... He specialized himself in, in uh, railway and logistic questions. So, Mr. Roll, the floor is yours. Feel free to use any language. And then uh, uh, we are going to dis, uh, exchange views on it first within the circle of the panel. Thank you, uh, President. Je vais parler français, si vous m'autorisez, pour la première intervention. Ce sera plus, plus confortable pour euh, chacun, puisque j'ai un anglais euh, qui That's est un peu bruxellois et teinté d'un accent français assez fort, donc je pense que ce sera plus confortable pour vous tous. Je vais vous présenter une, euh, en quelques slides Just une étude de l'Académie des technologies We have a a réalisée euh, sur les deux dernières années. Cette étude a été faite par yeah. la now we, we got the right channel. We'll start in, in the survey, we're dealing with uh, uh, mobility and transportation. That's one of our commissions and was created in December 2008. It was presented in Paris, and the survey can, of course, also be accessed at uh, Le Manuscrit, that's an editorial company. Uh, that is, you, if you have access to the internet, you can retrieve it from the internet. And the uh, issues that were surveyed uh, were about the population on the one hand, and many politicians claim that too, that many people say, well, that transport, uh, 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 rail transport should be done away with, and these groups then tell us that uh, freight transport will uh, diminish over the next few years. Why will it diminish? It is due to the fact that the conditions such as energy prices, environmental issues, will contribute to a freight a transport uh, going down. And one of the questions that was asked and that emerges immediately is uh, goods transport is part of the distribution train of the production chain 
and that actually uh, we're dealing with a wonderful tool for globalization and that each region and each state, each territory that does not develop its uh, goods transportation sector or has a supply chain of its own uh, will be losing out in competition or probably not be able to take part in the process of globalization. Actually, there will be only disadvantages for such players also in terms of labor. So these are the fundamental uh, premises that we formulated as we set forth with the survey. We then uh, started with the, the transport of goods. And actually, statistics were rather imprecise. Unfortunately, neither in France nor in Europe uh, do we have very precise fixtures. But we take it that 50% of the volume, and that will be somewhat higher in Germany than France, but that roughly 50% are transported uh, with uh, freight or transport uh, entities. Uh, uh, growth had been envisaged. Uh, no, we longer ha no longer have growth rates. That, of course, uh, is one of the trends observed in the process of globalization. As we look back uh, over the past 50 years, we can say that goods that have been produced have uh, multiplied by 45 and others have uh, multiplied uh, less, uh, by less than 10 percent as far as agriculture goods are concerned. Then which are now the most important issues as far as we are concerned in uh, manufactured uh, goods? It is, of course, important for someone to assume the responsibility from end to end, that is, from the machine to the machine. What we're dealing with is a supply chain that starts with the manufacturing, manufacturing uh, location, a virtual manufacturing location, which was formerly physically located at a given uh, location and was managed by a, an entrepreneur or operated. For instance, if you produced uh, pencils 50 years ago, it, it, this process has now been fully automated and uh, it converted into information technologies. And now it's important to have the supply chain functioning from end to end, from machine to machine. This is a fact. If machines today, for example, actually serve only to produce certain goods, you have a certain point of departure where something is being uh, assembled, you have an assembly line, and uh, this is where the products are then uh, passed on from this uh, location to other outlets and are delivered, are supplied, are delivered. So uh, permanently and really punctually, uh, we're talking of high precision, it must be made sure that the supply of the virtual company that is addressing the world, that what we need is a precise information system so as to make sure that we have the highest possible reliability. There must be no insecure interfaces. Now, if you have a look at uh, current supply chain uh, structures in virtual transportation services, and we've read everything uh, that has been uh, supplied in terms of information, we observe that we have a very, very high level of concentration of activities. They're very large logistics uh, companies. The largest ones are no longer transport companies or no longer are shipping companies. Actually, they are logistics experts in the true sense of the word. For instance, to take that example, Actually, we're not dealing with haulage companies anymore. These are logistics experts. That is the logistics of the German industry. It's the image you have today of what you what lies behind behind uh, logistics, and the whole PMI. That is the, the tiny ones. That is oh the, the small and medium-sized companies. 
the whole lot of uh, medium and small size companies can also acquire more competence in logistics, or they will be forced to turn to wherever expertise is found. That is, where they may not necessarily need the supply chain. So it is uh, certainly thinkable or feasible as we think of an integrated logistics system that all uh, the involved uh, players and stakeholders in uh, goods transportation adopt these precise information standards that are a valid and very efficient today already. That is, in rail transport, you have logistics expertise. These are very efficient companies. They're very advanced. And rail transport as a whole, of course, has not yet uh, a fully efficient system in America and Australia in the Soviet, former Soviet Union, rather in the Baltic uh, region. You have such a system that has been uh, in place for some time, but in other uh, places in Europe, there's still gaps. But these gaps will be closed over the next uh, few years. And by the way, what we're dealing with is European regulations that has um, been introduced. We can build up uh, or distinguish two different architectures, a material architecture, so to say, a structure that has the purpose to, uh, uh, or rather, relies on the fact that, uh, on the one hand, you have uh, uh, regions and areas where uh, manpower is expensive, and uh, that may be the area of a virtual company where uh, you must benefit from the different uh, advantages that different manufacturing uh, zones or areas offer, because investment is heavy in, in terms of training manpower, no matter where in the world you train uh, personnel, and you must have the possibility to rely on buffers where the price of labor varies. And all this is driven by the uh, intention to provide for these buffers and for compensation possibilities. So manufacturing sites will still be shifting. Uh, as far as that is concerned, 70% of European transport uh, activities, uh, goods transport activities uh, that comes from Asia is transported uh, by uh, the seas. That is, uh, that is maritime transport. And, and maritime transport is a very important link in the uh, chain and the supply chain. For instance, if you take the world as a virtual manufacturing location, we need harbors, we need ports, a dynamic, very uh, efficient and effective ports that uh, powerful ports that can absorb these streams. What we see is material and physical architecture. And this is something we can also discuss later on, because there's hardly any dialogue between industry, that is the manufacturing side, and the governments, the government level. That is the, the competent authorities or, or office holders. It's a rather difficult issue because actually what we see here is the same uh, scheme. What we see is increasing massification, and then there are other regions that are not affected at all. So on one hand, we have goods transport in a given territory, and on the other hand, there is nothing. And there's very little interaction between the various players in this virtual context, in this virtual company and the public uh, and public authorities. And this is, I think, where we must uh, focus our approach. We must make sure that all the involved players and stakeholders interact in a dialogue. Then we have invis the invisible second arm or hand in this uh, structure 
Uh, what we're dealing with is the need to optimize these capacities in real time, that is to be capable of uh, controlling transport costs, that is to, to, to shape them in real time. This is something we have already for passenger transport, but we need it also for goods transport. Now, mind you, we are not talking about conflicts between uh, passenger transport and goods transport because there have always been times and places where you may have had massive overlappings. This is something we must see in a more comprehensive world spanning um, panorama with these virtual companies. We must uh, make sure we have good structures so as to be able to provide for very good management of the whole. It's about optimizing the system and all its elements and facets to understand it and to really uh, penetrate it. What also seems to be rather important is that we're faced with a new business model. That we, well, we have common factoring, but actually what we're dealing with is transport activities. And these must be completely incorporated in manufacturing and distribution and controlled by the same uh, players. It's not something to be delegated on or to be subcontracted. Rather, it is important to have a full command and view of the whole system. So what we are aiming at is to develop a system. There will be new professions, for example, completely new uh, professions and professional profiles. Uh, there may be engineers as well as production experts and also in marketing and distribution. We must know about sales organization and marketing, and uh, we must be able to do these jobs. We must be able to manage and to take care of transport activities. So will be increasingly important even though uh, uh, activities that are still separate may sort of disappear and be in integrated into the whole system. So 20% or 25% of uh, logistics transport as such will amount to only about 25% of uh, overall turnover obtained by the logistics companies. Furthermore, there's another uh, sensitive aspect, cost. There, Three elements or facets that should be mentioned in C1. The fir first of all, we have the energy costs. Energy costs also uh, with regards to the level of value added tax that is levied. You know that over the past 15 years, energy sources have uh, uh, increased, uh, the prices have increased substantially. Uh, just take uh, oil, uh, which was the main indicator, followed by diesel, gas, and other energy sources that have uh, uh, followed the same trend as uh, we've seen in oils and energy structures, and that also pollutants and, and emissions, uh, except for CO2. Uh, so cost structures also influenced by such factors and CO2 emissions, of course, must be paid for. All these add to the consideration CO2. That is, first of all, what you have to take into consideration is the price of a barrel of oil. And of course, we're dealing with a very few, that is a very low percentage that might diverge. But then there's a real cost factor in terms of infrastructures noise pollution, for example, yes, that's another aspect, that's another cost factor. That is, all the different transport modes uh, have their influence on cost. C3, uh, for example, this is why we think that's less important 
that maybe the influence uh, will be less important. Actually, what we're dealing with is CO2 emissions. That certainly is something the transport sector is concerned with. Some industries are the main responsible ones. And of course, the population at large, uh, they have their heating systems, uh, uh, housing needs uh, heating systems. And this is what cost will not rise uh, considerably. This is what we assume, that it's these three components, even if there is variation, that is, um, in, in the past 30 to 40 years, modes uh, have evolved and all these uh, effects have had an impact and will have an impact on the cost structure, but then what's more important is the difference in the cost uh, involved in uh, paying uh, manpower. This, these are the aspects where we will have to expect the strongest variations, that is, in what labor will cost us. So what are then the pros and cons of these uh, various scenarios? Uh, whenever you uh, see the global transport volume uh, by road, road haulage, well, of course, there will be efforts to uh, lower the uh, amount of CO2 emissions in the past uh, 10 to 15 years in Europe, at least. Emissions have remained on a stable level. Growth, uh, there was two-digit uh, growth rates every year. So you see major efforts have been made in terms of uh, technological so as to mitigate CO2 emissions. And that will be further, that, that aspect will be further developed and advanced. Rail transport, well, let me tell you that a lot has been done thanks to information technologies and also by um, regulations that have emanated from the European Commission in the next three years. The regulations will be uh, introduced. On the one hand, we can make more use of existing lines and we'll be able to lower costs. But on the other hand, we'll, by all means, have to rely again on a normal level of services. Today, we don't have the services we need, really, in rail transport. We think that optimizing uh, manufacturing sites and uh, distribution structures will help to make better use of existing technologies that are available. So that is, in the next 10 to 15 years, we'll probably see uh, an adjustment. It won't tend towards zero, but uh, certainly there will be a reduction. And what we're interested in, in is a better quality uh, in terms of the services, and we also want to increase output. Now, very last remark, as you have a look at the transport system and at the logistics aspect, uh, let's say compare uh, the goods transport in uh, France uh, with passenger transport, our system is indeed a poor one. Very little is uh, done in terms of uh, scientific research and studies. Uh, actually, we know a lot more about passenger transport uh, over freight uh, transport, uh, 20 to 80 more or less. And that depends on the region, the different regional variations. We must make sure that the goods transport system is further advanced and better developed. What we need is to transmit a, an improved image to the younger generations and tell them that goods transport is something that can indeed be attractive. Uh, efforts are made to optimize the sector. New uh, novelties are initiated and in, in 
the logistics sector and the transport sector, for instance, we know, we are aware that more has to be done in the future. And in order to be able to do this uh, in the context of a globalization, uh, logistics experts and transport experts must be better educated and the universities must be uh, better prepared, uh, being aware that what it is about is to train experts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Rowell. <clears throat> and uh, um, the first intervention was indicated by Mrs. Mary Brooks, uh, who wanted to add a few things to this and highlight a few other elements of this uh, specific subject. Uh, she will have some slides to present us. Mrs. Brooks uh, is uh, from the uh, Dalhousie University from uh, Canada, and she's a professor there dealing with the research uh, on transportation and global supply chain management. Uh, I think uh, this is the gist of your uh, CV here, because I have certain short versions of the CVs. Um, so the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, uh, let you know at the beginning that I uh, prepared a paper which is in the um, uh, available on the website, um, and uh, it is on um, maritime cabotage. I was originally asked to provide um, uh, um, material on maritime cabotage because uh, changing cabotage is a um, long-term process, which is the gist of this first half of the panel, and um, altering the cabotage regulations um, will influence the uh, structure and nature of inland transportation and short sea shipping over a long period of time. In other words, it will have an impact on reshaping the supply chain, um, although it, uh, and so that's uh, the focus of this first um, half of the panel. Just to put it in context, um, it, uh, today's presentation is about uh, uh, essentially regional um, shipping, not international maritime transport, which has mostly an open market. And the only area where the market is still um, closed is in some sectors or some countries is in the port and ancillary services market. In the past, liner shipping has been a special case, but that has, uh, has uh, been um, undergoing some change uh, recently. So the focus of uh, um, my comments today are mostly about regional shipping, and uh, there's a wide range of cabotage regimes, and I'm going to talk about that for just a bit. Um, I think the key point here is that this is not being discussed at the WTO, and, um, and uh, it is an important part of, of ensuring that um, long-term change. Uh, short sea shipping works uh, in uh, niche markets in... Uh, markets where regulation restricts access. My example here is uh, uh, Canadian and U.S. Uh, services on the North American East Coast, as you can see. Um, very specific services, but uh, somewhat limited um, by the cabotage regulations in um, uh, the U.S. and Canada. Um, it uh, does not work as well, therefore, in North America as it does in Europe. I've given you an example here of the routes in the Baltic region, which um, are very effective in delivering um, uh, uh, services to the total supply chain. The range of maritime cabotage regimes you will find out there is very wide. I've put a continuum here um, and provided some illustrations of what is at either end. On the very restrictive end, we have the totally closed markets of Japan, China, and the U.S. And on the very liberal end, we have Australia and New Zealand. And in the middle, we have the EU and closer to the U.S. than this looks like is Canada. Um, the Australians, New Zealand uh, uh, market right now is um, actually thinking of moving towards a slightly less liberal uh, point of view because they're having some difficulty in the competition, and I'll come to that in a minute. The EU is thinking of moving in the other direction um, uh, and becoming a little more liberal. 
The driving factor behind these is that um, the uh, Australian New Zealand market is finding that they don't have a level playing field between international and the short sea market. And so at this point in time, the international market is, uh, is uh, um, uh, leaving very little room for uh, the local operator. At the very other end of the continuum, I'd like to call uh, the situation one of failure to launch. In spite of the fact that both Canada and the U.S. have um, plans in place to try and promote short sea shipping, neither of them has made the regulatory changes necessary to actually um, launch services other than in niche markets. And in the middle, we have a marketplace which has gradually liberalized and introduced a tonnage tax and seen the issue as more related to greenhouse gas um, as part of their um, uh, plans on a go-forward basis. Just to provide some illustration of how cabotage regulation affects landside transport, I wanted to just uh, uh, give you this uh, brief thought. Let's take a look at a map of the congestion developed out of the port of New York, New Jersey. So this is just traffic through one port as an illustration. And you can see that there's still a fair bit of that uh, congestion deriving um, north-south. Uh, North American research has shown that um, uh, ships can be competitive against trucks in corridors of under 100, uh, sorry, under 1,000 nautical miles. And if we draw that 1,000 nautical miles, you could see we could take a lot off the road if we had a competitive short sea service in this region or in this region or in this region. So why hasn't it developed? If we take a look at what the world is going to look like in 2035, according to the uh, U.S. Federal Highway Administration, you can see that the congestion is expected to get worse. And yet, what are they talking about? They're talking about putting more money into road infrastructure. You can see that the three corridors where short sea could work quite well in North America, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, and in the Gulf of Mexico, there are actually money planned to be spent on highways. So the question really is, is about market boundary. On the left-hand side, we have a picture of the international marketplace. And it seems to do very well with economies of scale and um, a relatively tax-free um, an environment. In fact, those are the two grounds on which it competes. On the right-hand side, we have road congestion. And right now, regulatory, the regulatory environment actually favors the development of more road congestion. And in the middle, we have short sea shipping attempting to expand, to, to, to take pieces of both markets and not doing terribly well at it. So my key conclusions that I wanted to draw for you today in terms of uh, thoughts about the future development of supply chain management is that um, the WTO has not proven to be the battleground, I guess, in terms of reconciling national with regional interests. And yet, perhaps maybe the more appropriate forum might be the OECD. And the reason that I say this is because um, this battleground is really a battleground for developed countries um, at this point in time. The second thought that I have is that the interplay between all three of these markets is going to be a challenge um, in terms of supply chain competition. And um, I think perhaps maybe we need to think a bit more about how we deal with the regional shipping piece that's sandwiched in the middle. The EU focus on liberalizing um, the marketplace I think has been a good positive one, and I'm, I'm delighted to see that they're actually thinking about removing further administrative burden and focusing on developing um, Marco Polo initiatives, and I think they provide lots of lessons for the rest of uh, the OECD. Um, Australia and New Zealand, on the other hand, I think they need to rethink their tax environment, and tonnage tax would be a solution that would help them resolve their market boundary issues in that particular market. North America, on the other hand, has a different kind of problem, and um, the problem may be a Canada-U.S. problem as opposed to a NAFTA problem if we're going to figure out how to get past this failure to launch. And the two really do need to think about it from a cargo interest perspective. I think he who pays for the freight rules, and right now, he who pays for the freight's choosing truck. Um, there are efforts in terms of eliminating harbor maintenance tax on NAFTA shipments and a uh, lack of focus on security and administrative rules. Um, are those are places that um, obviously would be a start. So I thank you very much for the opportunity 
to talk with you, and I'd like to um, look forward to any commentary you may have on how this will affect supply chains elsewhere. Thank you, Mrs. Brooks. And uh, uh, this was a rather specific element of the mm -hmm. uh, supply chain issue. Uh, our next participant in the discussions is Mr. Lars Goran Rosengren, who is from AB Volvo. Uh, he is the vice president responsible for innovation, strategy, and policy. And he is going to share with us his views. Uh, which is practically the views of the industry. Um, for the commercial vehicle industry, the globalization of uh, product platforms and sourcing combined with local assembly continues. And that means we will have increasing transport flows at present mainly emanating from Europe. In the future, more will come from Asia. And, of course, there is a need for environmentally sustainable, cost-effective, reliable, safe, integrated, and intermodal supply chain solutions. Um, um, if we look at the quality of the transport services offered to meet these industry demands today, and the tools for supply chain design, we think that the, the services sometimes are a little weak uh, and that we need some improvements here. Uh, and probably in some areas we need to have more of public governance to effectively couple transport and traffic, for instance. And uh, Mr. Rule uh, mentioned the new concepts and architectures for design and operations as well as scientific modeling of the integrated real-time transport and traffic operations. There's a lot of aggregated an analysis, but maybe not enough with uh, detailed modeling. So I very much agree with your conclusions there. The, if we go a little bit deeper than the, the solutions for intermodal switchings, are often, still often, rather inefficient uh, and slow. So, so we need to have more innovative road, sea, rail transfer solutions, both for goods and the documents, or whatever we shall call them, the, the paperless transport. The infrastructure bottlenecks exist, and they lead to uh, unreliability and reduced speed. And the Commission is pushing the co-modal green high-capacity corridors. We think that we can have high-capacity vehicles there too. Truck trains, for instance, we think could be very efficient. And we think they can live together with the, with the real trains, I would say. There are lots of energy uh, savings to be, to be done there. So it's very much appreciated. Uh, the load carrier and um, vehicle capacity, if you go out in, in the real world, is, is not often fully used. If you make a random test, maybe 50% uh, load factor. So, so uh, we need to have more planned and real-time sharing of, of the load carriers and vehicles for, for general components. But we also have among the industry uh, more shared industry distribution channels where we also plan the distribution to the dealers together. Uh, and hopefully then we can utilize the system that we have much better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosengren. <clears throat> the next speaker is going to be Mr. Lauri Oyala, who is from the Turku School of Economics, and uh, he is a professional dealing with uh, uh, logistics at the Turku School, and uh, he does a research work at the same time there uh, concerning the international logistics and transport markets. So, Mr. Uyala. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you also for the uh, 
first uh, commentaries and, and the introductory presentation by Mr. Raul, which I would like to perhaps uh, elaborate a bit on uh, onwards. Um, I very much uh, endorse the ideas put, put forward by Mr. Raul also in the broader paper that was uh, made available and is, is available in the Internet uh, website. Uh, I think uh, one of the key points you raised was that the transport issues, the transport costs are no longer the major driver. I don't know if they have been the major driver for manufacturing uh, companies being as shippers or users of transport logistics services uh, for a long time, because um, especially uh, during the past, let's say, five, six, seven years, and in particular during the, the uh, current economic uh, downturn, what is the main driver for manufacturing industries or even retail wholesale trading companies? It's the demand uncertainty and the very low visibility in supply chains that the companies are struggling with. So managing that uncertainty and that low visibility is really the, the key issue. What uh, has also uh, been, been um, sort of a making things a bit more complicated is the constantly increasing security, partly safety, but mainly security requirements in international trade uh, you have the United States C CTPAT uh, regulations and, and uh, worldwide also the World Customs Organization, European Union, advocated uh, authorized economic operator type of things, which all are now being implemented in the same time, which is a bit confusing situation. The deadlines for who is uh, giving these authorizations are slipping further away, and uh, it may be not always that clear what are the, are the implications. So putting these two things together, the, the demand uncertainty and um, increasing requirements both on the safety security side and also uh, making more of the external costs of uh, transportation uh, internal through increasing um, um, costs or fees both for the transport equipment and the usage of transportation, a good aim in its own right uh, pushes the, the, the things further. So managing this, uh, co these complex supply chains is really the main, main challenge that the companies are facing. Transport is not, or transport costs even are not the main, main issue. And um, even, even though the topic of our workshop is intermodal transport and supply chains, I would also like to argue that for most shippers who are using transport logistic services, the transport mode, whether it is intermodal, unimodal, or, or any combination of those, is not uh, a major concern. It's not a means in its... I mean, it's just a means. It's not an end in, it, in itself. And uh, I would like to round up and finalize my comment by also raising the issue that... Um, uh, Talking about transport costs, logistics costs, uh, how much are they actually in, um, in, in industries, manufacturing companies, where, uh, trading companies' uh, cost structure? How much are they in GDP, for example, if you want to put them into relation on a national level? It's a very un uncertain territory because there is no consensus of uh, what logistics costs are, how to define them. Individual companies can treat them precisely as they will or disregard using this terminology. Uh, however, attempts have been made both on national level and, and some comparative studies. Um, one very recent example is already in the, in the ITF website, which was uh, conducted uh, on co or commissioned by the Ministry of Transport Communications in Finland. Which, uh, where we gathered uh, almost 3,000 firms' responses to a very large survey. It's probably the largest survey there is in the world on the uh, structure and development needs of, of logistics and logistics costs. We got the result that the manufacturing industry's logistics costs are about 15%, 14% of the turnover. Transportation, direct transport freight-related costs are about a third maybe slightly more now, about 40% of the total package. It's more the inventory running costs and uh, uh, sort of a supply chain management administration type of costs rather than direct freight costs. 
Then again, uh, logistics costs have also been uh, analyzed, measured by uh, already uh, for 20 years by a United States State of Logistics report. In Sweden, very recently last year, there was a similar attempt that put the GDP share of logistics costs in Sweden and United States to about 8% uh, of the GDP. Well, uh, that may very well be true, but uh, still the methodologies are, are uh, very much in need of development, and you can only do this type of uh, national accounts based of analysis if you have very good statistics. You can't do them across uh, every country. And uh, finally, uh, this is also something, uh, in my background I've been working quite a lot with the World Bank, and we have now started a, a major initiative uh, to set up a worldwide effort to, to find a, at least a common denominator how to measure and collect data on logistics costs, both on company and macro level. And, and this is something we are working heavily now in the next few months and the next few years to get a sort of a, uh, let's say, level playing field, how, how these things can be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Oyala. It's an extremely interesting intervention and uh, the figures what you mentioned were also very interesting because the magnitude what we are talking about on a European level is uh, roughly about 13, 1400 billion euros a year in, in, on a European level. So it's, uh, it's a very important element for the national budget, for the national governments and of course it's uh, even more important uh, for the individual companies. Uh, how they can uh, uh, reach the best and optimal uh, solutions uh, when they set up their transportation operations concerning uh, any types of goods. Our last speaker who indicated his intention to participate on this discussion uh, from the panel is Mr. Hans Jekel, who is from the Netherlands and uh, he works for the affiliate of the Ministry of Transport, which is the Road and Water Directorate uh, of the Netherlands, and uh, he is a director in its uh, transport research institution. And uh, uh, he has different other functions. He is an expert in the subject, so please listen to him very carefully. Well, the question is, uh, uh, dear Chair, whether I'll be really an expert. Um, we have a wonderful working party which is working in uh, OECD and ITF on a report about uh, reliability issues related to transport systems. Um, transport systems have their uh, operation, whether rail or road, that's the two we really have a focus um, uh, on. And what you see coming up at the moment is the issue of reliability. Um, uh, reliability is becoming far more important than it, uh, in it has been. And it has basically, as, as we feel in, in the working party, to do with the fact that we have those sort of complex change which has to be delivered on the one hand. And we have all sorts of uh, um, circumstances in our transport systems which sometimes just don't can deliver the amount of reliability that is more or less expected. And that gives me the idea of what is the definition that we use in um, the working party and that we will bring into the report, which is on the verge of publication. I think it will be published early uh, autumn uh, in OECD uh, print. Um, the, the definition of, of reliability as we use it is the ability of a transport system to provide the expected level of service quality on, upon, upon, uh, upon which users have organized their activities. So it's about the way users organize their activities and it's about expectation. Uh, reliability is basically about expectation and uh, well, mostly um, the users, uh, the, the, the shippers, uh, 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 the uh, organizations that do the management of the complex uh, supply uh, uh, change have a, a, a vision and have an uh, uh, expectation on what the transport system, whether it be a road or rail, will deliver. Well, is um, 
there with um, reliability about congestion. No, not totally. Um, look at it this way. Uh, when an area, uh, when a transport system is congested, but it's congested more or less on a recurrent basis, every day that you have the same, well, the same congestion more or less at the same uh, place with a little bit variety. Well, basically, uh, you, uh, the, the, the shippers that have the complex change, they can plan, they can organize. They, 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 they should be able to organize. So, yes, it's a problem, but it's not a problem of reliability. It's a problem of congestion. What is a problem of reliability is the non-recurrent element where you really, at a certain moment, have weather conditions, extreme weather conditions, whether you have incidents, those sort of elements are really focusing up on the reliability issues. Well, what is then, uh, in our perspective of the Wood Party, what are the more unreliable situations in, in the transport system? We, we identified, I think, a number of them, but I'll give you four. The first one is, is a, a bad general condition and a mismanagement of the hill, road, and rail network. Well, lots of countries have that problem. And for that reason, they even are not into, you can say, in the global trade sphere. Look at a number of countries in the, in the developing uh, uh, world. The, the second one is about ports and, and the connection from ports to hinterlands. Um, why is that a problem? Because most ports, at, at, at least certainly in Europe and basically also in the United States, look at Santa Barbara, um, are also big cities. So you have um, intermingling of two types of traffic. On the one hand, the, the, the traffic at, it, within the city, and on the other hand, the traffic from the port to, uh, to, uh, to the hinterland. And basically, that, that looks a little bit like spaghetti, uh, which <laughs> sometimes really creates problems uh, uh, everywhere. Um, that's a situation that uh, we really have to address uh, when you look from a reliability point of view. The third one is the border crossings. Uh, Lauri Ojala already made that uh, remark. The element of security, the element of customs, uh, and especially the variety in those sort of uh, elements in the way it, they're being uh, and undertaken by, uh, by the officials. That's a, a, a reliability problem. And the last one, I already mentioned that one, is the non-recurrent congestion. Well, what can you do about it? And reliability. Well, that comes, I, I come a little bit in the direction, I think, of Ojala when he says, well, yeah, how important is transport in the whole management of a complex uh, chain? First question is, uh, uh, how, in which situations is unreliability really important? Well, we certainly know that it will be with oysters, it will be with perishable goods, and so on and so forth. But how far is that further a, a, a problem? And then I don't mean a problem in global talk, because then it's a problem always, but uh, I mean in real life, in real pricing, and so on and, and so forth. Um, so what we do, we, we in the report make a plea uh, for bringing reliability into cost-benefit analysis uh, everywhere, so that we really can say and can see that we have a sort of form of discussion, how important is it? Second question, when we have concluded that it, in a number of circumstances, yes, it will be important, uh, who should pay for a better level of uh, reliability? Goes it all back to uh, the, the transport managers in road and in rail? They say, well, yeah, we, we can, we're going to deliver it. Or is there, uh, a, a, is there other routes? Well, we identify four routes, uh, basically. You can build your uh, uh, way out of reliability, new uh, roads, as Mary Brooks uh, showed us on, uh, on her nice um, uh, map. You can manage by traffic management your existing capacity better. That's, I, I think, a, a good route uh, to take. Uh, you can uh, develop direct charging pricing for reliability, and you can far better use, uh, we think, the information services, because lots of management of uh, uh, complex change is about information. Well, the last element I would like to um, uh, uh, give you is two different perspectives, and you all know it uh, when you at least are sometimes a railway passenger. You have the perspective from a network manager. And the network manager is busy with, well, optimization of his system. And you have the perspective of a user, and the user only needs a good performance on one element in the chain. 
um, when to put it in the railway uh, from a railway passenger, well, it's, it's nice that the railway is more or less on time, three minutes delay, which is in the, well, the accepted uh, zone of, of governance of, 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 of delay. But yes, you miss your connection by those uh, 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 three minutes. So that's the, the, the sort of things we're looking at at the moment in the, uh, in the, the finalization of the report of the working party. And we, lope, we hope that with this we can bring in the reliability in the supply chain thinking and also on the passenger side, but I'm not mentioning that now. Um, so that hopefully in a few years we can talk more about reliability. Yeah, this is the issue really, and we sorted it out a little bit more than we have now sorted it uh, out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jekyll. I couldn't help uh, raising a question in this regard because uh, you specifically addressed the readiness of the clients to uh, cover certain cost elements if the cost-benefit uh, calculations show that the reliability is in embedded or included in the pricing. Will the market react on it positively or will the market reward the cost calculations of this type? Um, uh, you also referred to uh, the issue of the buffering. Mr. Raul uh, uh, talked about uh, the buffering principle at the beginning. I think uh, that uh, there is certainly kind of a balance between the proper level of reliability and the buffering calculations, or it should, there should be. Uh, what do you think? Where, where are those limits or orders between those two things? I think it will, um, it will certainly differ and, and you will um, uh, get experience in, 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 the years, um, in the years to come. Basically, I, I think there is expected um, a, a good reliability from, uh, from the, the, the transport uh, and, and networks. And we can deliver, well, a rather well uh, reliability, but at, at a certain moment it becomes complex. It becomes complex because we have very complex chains, uh, and it becomes complex um, whether uh, uh, you have a number of really goods that well that have a sort of time uh, time frame because of the type of goods. Where there at first you will certainly have the discussion on uh, 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 are uh, uh, shippers uh, going to pay for extra uh, reliability or should uh, the, the the railway providers uh, the, uh, or the the road uh, uh, the road agencies should they uh, deliver something more than than they have just done? They hope to do that. That that's a little bit the expectation to talk about our expectations on the traffic management side. But uh, the, the question is, well, what will we see happening in in in, in the years to come? We only give elements for for discussion. I want to, be very uh, very polite. We only give elements for the for the discussion, so we are, we're not going into that and saying, well, this will will happen or won't happen. It was a provocative question, by the way. So uh, the floor is open. Uh, please feel free to put questions or make comments uh, uh, from the audience. I see one uh, hand there. If you, I think there are some micros around, so you will get one. Could I make my own? It's already on. Uh, could I give my own thanks to the, uh, the, the introductory speeches, which were very interesting. My question is to do with reliability and people's uh, approach to it. And it goes right back to when I first did the freight studies for the Channel Tunnel in 1971-72. Uh, the way that... Uh, logistics providers, and they weren't called that, they were called freight forwarders in those days, uh, reacted to reliability was to reduce the number of actors to an absolute minimum. So truck drivers who are committed to taking a particular load a long distance were regarded as the most controllable and reliable way, means of local distribution. And what's more, they were often given two nights at a hotel at the other end to try and get a backload. So they were part of the marketing process as well. Uh, now, this seems to me to relate also to Professor Brooks's comments uh, about cabotage 
uh, and, and about secondary uh, shipping networks and transshipment. There was a strong resistance against transshipment in those days because of the extra actor, the extra port, and, and the extra shipping line. It was just another cog in the, the machine which uh, could break down, could strip. So my question is, is this still a major issue, or are we reaching the stage where our management systems allow us to operate much longer chains with more actors, with reliability? Thank you. <laughs> I, um, uh, just a I moment, sir. I forgot to ask that uh, those who ask for the floor would indicate uh, his or her name. So, uh, uh, or, the, or the company he or her, she represents. May I ask you to... I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I should have thought of that. I'm Robert Cochran, and I'm from Imperial College London. Uh, be careful, because probably you will get some uh, direct mails from some of the panelists. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, uh, I had uh, uh, thought that it would be useful to think about reliability um, uh, definitions because reliability means different things to, to different people. When you talk to shipping lines, they quite often think of reliability as something, as long as I got it there within 24 hours, 60% of the time I was kind of reliable, um, whereas trucking companies think about reliability in that I have a just-in-time delivery that's due in a 15-minute window, and if I miss it, it's not going to be accepted. And so everybody has a different perspective of reliability, and I'm... I'm uh, I realize that when you do transshipment, you add an extra problem into the equation. But on the other hand, if you're transshipping um, uh, to short C and uh, the route is more reliable because the highway is congested, then you may actually be um, better off on the other hand, if you're um, transshipping to truck and uh, the truck is doing better, then you have a, a different one. So I think it, it, it always is very situation-specific. Um, and we have managed uh, to, over time, I think, reduce the, the, the transfer costs um, of cargo handling in some markets. I just wish it was lower in North America like it is in um, Asia. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je voulais juste faire deux remarques à la suite de cette question. La première, c'est que... Two remarks. Cette, ce, problème, ce besoin de, de reliability, vous avez fortement, euh, sur lequel vous avez plus fortement insisté, uh, me paraît beaucoup plus important you have pour les manufacturiers que pour le reste. On... Uh, that is for the si manufacturer, because it's, it's, it's more important than anything else. Other mineral products will also be subject to these considerations, but above all, it's about manufactured goods. That is, the, the virtual company, the virtual uh, international company to make sure it's functioning, that is, if goods are transported from China, manufactured in China, that is, uh, taken or transported to Europe or somewhere else, uh, that presupposes that everything must work in such a way as if the two machines were located one next to the other. That's what it's all about in this virtual world, that the services must be guaranteed along all these lines. And that's the fundamental problem. That's actually what the virtual world company is based on. And there are different possibilities. That, I think, however, is the very basis on which uh, the structure must rest. All of us have talked about the, this aspect, but we have not uh, discussed the other 50 percent. That is where reliability is also of the essence and must be guaranteed. How can we make sure that uh, reliability is guaranteed? How can we implement this just in time, that is to not transport everything uh, for instance, by air only. This may work today, but we do see difficulties, but still it is working in spite of everything. There are companies that may have problems 
in delivering on time, Mr. Jekyll mentioned it. Of course, and then we have these congested uh, transport systems. We, we have them today. Still, I think if you have a good information, good efficient information system in place, you can uh, solve these problems. That is, infrastructures, of course, uh, must be subject to better use, and uh, of course, just in time can always also be improved. As for rail transport, you know that uh, uh, the problem of rail transport is that it uh, has this image of not uh, being very reliable. I visited Mr. Lochberg, and uh, what you see there is a 160 trains that are passing through this location. And with a one-second delay on the average per train, uh, we're quite good in Japan. Trains, uh, on the average, have about uh, have delays of about six seconds. That is very high precision. Still, usually, I like the view of Mr. Raoul about uh, the two machines more or less standing near to another, and and that is the ideal situation. Uh, not able the real to world is that the there is a route between the machines, and there's well, we talk about frictions when you do it, uh, put it as easy as possible, and. Uh, to give an answer uh, to, to, to uh, uh, the, the man who asked the, the, the question, um, uh, we uh, looked at the idea of getting as less actors as possible, and it came up, uh, especially when we were in Washington. Uh, in the United States, the uh, highway agency also has a research program in which one of the four focuses is about reliability. And they have a, a, an advisory commission, and, uh, well, basically, I think we talked for a number of hours on what happens in the, uh, in the companies that manage the complex chains, what happens in those companies. Because lots of the reliability, well, they don't ad address that, those problems to, to government or, or something uh, like that, because they already have, have coped with re uh, reliability issues in some way or another within their, well, within their work. Uh, and, and then you come up at those sort of elements. Well, the, the, the best experienced drivers, you pay them, you pay them extra. They do, do, do something. We had experiences there, and we heard experiences from the Canadian um, uh, American border on the other side in, in Vancouver, and so uh, lots of problems. Vancouver, Seattle, Tacoma, uh, that uh, and, uh, that region. So, so yes, this this is an important issue, but it's um, it's something that happens within organizations uh, already, and need not between organizations. We are, our focus is a little bit more on, well, uh, the rail and road uh, 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 sector, what they can deliver. Thank you. I think for the same subject, Mr. Werner would like to add something, who is also going to be a speaker during the course of the next half, and then I will introduce him. Okay, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. So it's a pleasure to be here in this uh, very interesting group. Um, and I already listened now more than one hour, and I um, thought about reliability, but one thing is for sure, reliability costs money. And if I face to the actual situation, it's very interesting to have all the theoretical items, but actual, you can carry a container from China to Germany for 150 US dollar. So we can speak about reliability and uh, uh, um, uh, one second uh, too late trains, about a lot of things. We can do a lot of things, but we, someone has to pay it, pay for it. And um, so we are actually in a situation where the business, the, our customers, I already not heard enough about customers here. So um, the question is, what, what are the customers asking for, actually? They, are, they have global business, so we as logistic providers have to go global. That's very simple, and it will remain global. There will be a D-Day after the crisis, and that's for sure. So we have now time to... Re, to make a reset of all the things we were in all that time when we had increases of 10%, 15% every year in intermodal business, to have to, to be fit for the D-Day. And um, 
actual transport costs are too cheap. Absolutely too cheap. If we, if we remain on that level, we will have lately in 12 months a total other market for transport. We would see that even huge logistic providers, and I talk about logistics providers, not about forwarding companies, will not be there anymore. Um, I can tell you that in my intermodal business I'm responsible for, and that is not only the business on rail in Germany, but in Europe and worldwide, we lose a lot of revenue. And I look over to my colleague, Mr. Lapidus. I read that in Russia is nearly the same. So the question is, who will survive and what can we do to, at the end, supply our customers in the way they recommend it. And uh, therefore, um, yes, thank you for being in that round, but uh, I would like, and that's my personal point of view, uh, to have a more uh, realistic side on the actual, uh, on the actual uh, situation. And... Uh, uh, how, how are we going to face the situation uh, f for the next year? Thank you. I saw some uh, requests from the floor, so Mr. Scorgetti. No. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kazatsai. Um, good afternoon. My name is Marco Scorgetti, and I'm the director of ClickUt. We are the European level federation of freight forwarders and logistics. There are three points that I think are worth maybe a comment. The first is um, on the issue of uh, short C. Um, we have written many times, and I think it is a factor that has always to be considered. Um, we, we believe that there must be a geographical advantage for short C to work well um, over and above other modes. Otherwise... Um, the, the intervening factors like transshipment and additional costs normally kill. The, and uh, we are definitely not in agreement um, with the fact that we should welcome constraints in other modes to facilitate short C. Um, it should make the case in itself. Um, on the reliability issue, uh, from our perspective, reliability is a given. It must be... Um, one way or another provided to the shipper because otherwise the shippers are not happy and they are our clients. So that's, um, that's an issue. It does cost money, though. It is quite, quite considerable, the amount of money it costs. But the one suggestion that I wanted to make is this one. You are talking of the supply chain, and in my experience, the supply chain is not one. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different supply chains and with different aspects. And one of the aspects, uh, you can class them in many ways, uh, pull, push, um, inventory, govern, whatever. But one of the aspects that normally does not get analyzed, and in my opinion it's a pity, is that there is a supply chain that is born with a mindset to the size of the load, i.e. people that work in container mind. And there is another supply chain that is set with the mind of the market, of reduction, the goods must be on the shelf, and then it comes in all sizes. And these two different, different ways of dealing with the supply chain do create the conditions of the market today. And, I mean, our companies, of course, deal in both, but they are most helpful in the second part because without us, the second part simply wouldn't exist. But it's a different mindset. It, it, it actually poses different challenges, and I think it is worth investigating this different approach to the supply chain that, in my opinion, has not been investigated from this point of view in all the depths that it should be done. Thank you. Thank you. We still have time for one more intervention. Uh, for, just for the sake of the change, a lady.
Thank you and good afternoon. I'm very interested in all the conversations uh, you and the questions you have been raised today because I'm from Bulgaria, but I'm working in the European Commission, uh, Director General for Energy and Transport, and I'm very privileged to be with experts in this area in supply chain and especially intermodal transport development. I want to raise the question how much we can really assess the needs of the local populations, especially in remote areas, mountain areas, people who live in uh, areas which, which are not very central European or central of, um, uh, of the country, because sometimes we deliver a lot of goods which cannot be consumed by people because some people, population is very poor, or at the moment is, uh, let's say, out of uh, uh, jobs uh, or employment. And I have been seeing... Uh, third countries which cannot really consume this. Can, for example, the government or regions um, identify their constraints and respond questions, a dialogue, local, regional, national, and even European and global dialogue, how much is needed to consume for a population and how can we deliver cheaper maybe products or maybe uh, investigate manufacturing industry or, uh, or actors, different actors, that we can uh, really have less transport cost but more targeted actions which uh, transport is needed but not on all costs because also the producer cannot have anything if these uh, uh, manufacturing goods are not consumed in these areas. That is my question. I think we have to make a clear distinction between the political part of your question and the technical part of your question. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm looking around, uh, 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 looking at the panelists, who would be brave enough to react on it? Mr. Fay. <clears throat> uh, I just want to say something about uh, the, how to meet the, the needs of transport in, in the remote area or poor uh, community. Yeah? For example, that's in China, a lot of uh, uh, village in the, in the countryside, in the remote country, in the, in the mountains, and we, we do have some special program. It's mainly from the government uh, policy. Yeah? They give special subsidies to the factory, factory if they, they can sell their products in a remote, remote area. Also, they, uh, they provide the basic uh, 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 have a, uh, favorite policy to invest in, uh, in uh, infrastructure for transport by, by road, by uh, inland, inland shipping. And also, uh, they have some. Uh, I see. I see a uh, lots of pol policies, not only in China, also in the other other part of the world. They they use uh, uh, close subsidy uh, uh, policy to encourage the logistic companies to provide a reliable and uh, fixed uh, service to the re remote uh, areas. I don't know whether. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a last, last question or remark uh, from anybody? The gentleman over there. Thank you. I'm Simon Bennett from the International Chamber of Shipping. We're the Global Trade Association for Ship Operators. Just two quick comments, if I may. I think it was Mr. Mr. Rowell who suggested that the the price of fuel um, does not impact um, switching between transport modes. And I would suggest this is not the case, as we're, we're currently seeing with um, the recent adoption of a global regime to remove sulfur from ship's fuel. And we're likely to see again with the current debate on CO2, which we'll address later this week. Um, with regard to Mary Brooks's excellent um, presentation, we'd all like to see the elimination of cabotage around the world. But I'd suggest the elephant in the room, which you didn't mention, in the United States is the Jones Act. Um, we're really not going to see any movement there, and we shouldn't let that prejudice U.S. engagement in the um, negotiations on um, international maritime transport services. Um, finally, I was amazed by the comment we heard that um, transport is too cheap. Um, we've certainly never heard um, any of our customers suggest that this is um, the case. And then finally, um, liability between um, transport modes. 
Um, just like to put in an advert for the new um, UNCITRAL convention on cargo liability, shortly to become the Rotterdam rules. And we're rather dismayed that our friends in the European Commission are still promoting a regional cargo liability regime um, before the ink has even been signed on, a, on the new international um, intermodal, multimodal liability convention. Sorry, that was more than two remarks, but thank you. Thank you. I think it was rather a comment than a question addressed to anybody. So uh, uh, I look around in the, among the panelists. Nobody. Ah, Mr. Jäger. One short remark about uh, the, the, the fuel prices in relation to the transport motor is a interesting paper of Mr. Hummels about that one, um, where, you, where you see that when fuel prices um, are rising, there will come a, a sort of um, a change from air transport to our, towards sea transport. And, and that, that sort of, um, well, at what moment with rising fuel prices will happen something with the transport, transport modes that the, 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 the companies, the shipping companies use, uh, that's very important, I think, also from, from my perspective working in the, in the road administration. Uh, just uh, on this point, uh, thank you. Uh, of course, I have not spoken about air transport. Air transport is out of my point of view. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, I uh, should have precised that. Uh, but, uh, and why? Be, uh, because air transport is not only linked to the cost of fuel, but also to the optimization of passenger transportation. And so it's something very difficult to analyze on the, the, uh, to analyze the impact of the cost of fuel on the air transport. But uh, I think that in the future, and I have, we have made the, the analysis, the cost of energy, evo the evolution of the cost of energy is the same for any kind of energy. So it's why we say that the evolution of fuel will not change a lot the competition between the modes. Um, to follow on this, uh, the, one of the questions that we had and, and uh, or comments we had was that fuel costs would not affect uh, uh, outcome. I agree that uh, it, there is a shift from air cargo to, to, to sea. Um, and uh, on the intercontinental trades, I would think that there will also be um, a shift from truck to rail in North America because um, the the rail infrastructure is much more developed or better developed for freight than in Europe. Um, so I, uh, I agree with the point that the transport cost in general is not as significant in the total scheme. Um, and there's an excellent point made on this in David Hummel's paper, which is also available um, uh, on the website. Uh, he uses the example of um, if you, one has a $16 bottle of wine versus a $160 bottle of wine, your, your, your view of the transport cost is a little different. But uh, there are many things. I, I don't expect that we're going to see um, people drinking less uh, French wine for reasons of its transport costs, although they may drink less French wine because Australians are producing a, a wine that's competitive in, in other markets. So. <laughs> just, just to add one point, uh, between the road and the uh, rail in uh, North America, of course, they are more or less at 50-50 now and, uh, at market share. And as far as I worked uh, a lot of years before, with the Clinton administration and transport. And uh, it appears for me very clearly that rail will suffer now of the congestion of the infrastructure. They have now, and they have no means to invest in new infrastructures. So, and one problem of the uh, uh, Federal Transit Administration is that if they don't invest or help investment in the railroad system, at this time, all the weight of investment for transportation, for goods transportation, inland good transportation, will go on road, 
and the Federal Transit Administration will have to pay by itself for everything. So the balance will be or they invest a part on the, road, on the rail system or they pay for all the expansion of the traffic in North America by themselves in road extension. So the, the shift will be due to that more, I think, than the cost of fuel. If I could just respond to that. Um, I, think that uh, uh, I think that the uh, situation in North America is uh, very complex. One of the complexities that is being imposed is that although rail is congested and has difficulty with developing um, new, new uh, 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 re infrastructure, um, there will be an imposition, as we've started to see with the uh, California Air Resources Board imposition, that uh, uh, trucks must be um, dispersed through the day as a health issue. So we're starting to see the environmental side um, start to put pressure on uh, on rail investment in order to take uh, trucks off the road. And um, we're also seeing that I think rail is uh, gaining uh, momentum in terms of its ability to attract uh, money from the government uh, as part of that uh, shift. So. Um, we may see that the private sector gets uh, something from from the highway administ you know the administration. Thank you. With this last comment, uh, we finished the uh, first part of our afternoon session. Uh, now we have a coffee break uh, until uh, uh, 4:10, and I would like to ask you to come back sharp. Uh, by the time, because the second part of the discussion is go going to tackle some other aspects of the same subject. Thank you. <laughs>